Well, another year of E3 has come and gone, which means that even more information has popped up regarding a variety of games. To be honest, I was ready to begin an analysis video on the next possible Link's Awakening trailer, but uh, I kind of got distracted. And I think a lot of others have as well, as I don't think I've seen a single analysis video on Link's Awakening. But that's probably because a bunch of demo gameplay videos are being posted. Around a week later, I'm kind of wanting to finally do an analysis video on the game. But not just any kind of analysis, I'm meaning THE analysis. We're going to go through not only the trailer, but also the Nintendo Treehouse and demo footage to find every single new thing shown off in this game. Before I begin, I have to disclaim that a lot of this footage used was taken from others who were there to experience the event. So I'm going to briefly go over these lovely individuals and give them the credit they deserve. First of all, thank you to Nintendo for both the E3 trailer and Nintendo Treehouse gameplay. All the Link's Awakening DX footage was also provided to you by the lovely Zelda Master. And lastly, any demo footage used was taken from the following channels on screen. All of their links will be down below in the description. Because there is so much information to take in, I'll break down this video into categories such as the trailer, music, new content, and so on. All of these will be time-coded in the comments for your convenience. Oh yeah, and I'll try my best to exclude anything we already saw in the first trailer. I figure that we might as well start with the E3 trailer, as that's the first thing we were met with. It begins with what is essentially the first shot of the game before the title screen. Only a portion of it plays before it fades to black, but thanks to Nintendo Wire we get to see the full opening. What's really cool is how true to the original source material this remake is. Because in both versions, Marin shakes Link's body three times. Though in the remake, she continues to do so as the camera moves. Speaking of the camera, instead of moving up, it goes to the upper right. We're given a shot of Link waking up in Marin's house. And this is when you realize just how much effort went into modernizing this game, while also keeping it the same as the original. Every single piece of furniture within the Game Boy's version is in the one for the Switch. And even the shadows are pretty impressive, such as how this tree blocks some of the light entering the house. We can see this bluish void surrounding the building, but considering they had to remake the game that was on a system with a different aspect ratio, there was no way to avoid it. I do like how Terran appears to have a basket full of mushrooms, as given what is to come, it's pretty hilarious. We get to see the positives of using this tilted top-down perspective, as details such as these portraits can be found. All three of them can be made out as a shot of the whole island, Terran with a young Marin, and then an older version of her. There's another shot at a location close to one of the dungeons, and this brings up one of the best parts of the remake. The overworld isn't broken up into any subsections. Obviously, the Switch can handle all of this being loaded at once, and it adds so much to the immersion. For example, this is taken from the original game, and it helps illustrate how limited the hardware used to be. It was pretty easy to get lost, but now that you can see a lot more, it will help the player with planning their own route. We have some incredible depth of field effects created to make the world pop out a lot more, as seen from the blurring of the waterfall. In fact, this game appears to use a blur effect at the borders of the screen, which works quite well with the top-down gameplay. There are two new enemies within this shot that weren't in the first trailer. The bombers appear to have taken a significant color change, going from a deep red to a grassy green, as well as the Tektite, now being a shade of blue. And by seeing this, I only now realized that this was supposed to be an eye. They really did improve the model of this enemy. The eye also appears to follow the direction it jumps in. Nice detail. We get a shot of the beach, though nothing is worth noting since we already saw something similar in the first trailer. And we get our first look at the raccoon, one of the characters that is semi-important in the game. The mysterious woods was seen previously, though one of the things I'd like to point out is how atmospheric this title feels. There's a lot of different sound effects that really enhance the world, almost as if the developers took notes of Breath of the Wild. It's difficult to hear with the current music, but it will be much more obvious when we go into the demo gameplay. And what's more interesting is the comparison of dialogue between the original and remake. There is no difference. Like, it's word for word. 
I'm going to look out for possible differences throughout this analysis, but it seems like they did well in remaking the source material. They also use this moment as a clever editing trick to cut out to a montage of gameplay, though it does raise a good question. In the original, if the player proceeded to get lost, it would just transition to the next scene. But in this case, since the worlds are all loaded at once and there are no screen transitions, does the screen fade to white similar to the trailer? We get our first look at the Yarna Desert, as well as the design of the Pokies. A lot of the ones in Mario games tend to have a flower on the head, but as we can see, these ones are all covered in spikes. They seem to resemble Super Paper Mario's design the most, just change the spikes to a whitish color. And like the original game, the segments can be hit off the body and roll around similar to Koopa shells. The next segment is located right above Key Cavern, one of the dungeons in the game, and Link is seen fighting against a winged Octorok. There's nothing different about them as they also jumped to dodge the player's swings. But they seem to pause a bit longer before they jump again. That could just be me though. It's also a great time to bring up the fact that they fixed the hitboxes. What I mean is that in the original, if an enemy's sprite was touching yours, it would count as a hit. Even if they technically are jumping below you, you would still get damaged. Obviously a problem like that would by default get fixed, but it's another example of showing the restrictions of old hardware and why you should totally play this remake. And again, the amount you can see compared to the Game Boy game is incredible. You can actually see a glimpse of one of the warp panels. We get to see something completely new in the next shot, as Link appears to be using his Pegasus boots to hit some apples off a tree. This might not sound that significant, but it actually is. If you look in the top right, you can see two items equipped, and neither of them are the already mentioned boots. This means that some items will no longer have to be equipped every time you want to use them. And even one of the hosts on the Treehouse event confirmed this. I want to point out that a huge uh, UI improvement of this game is that your sword, shield, things like your power bracelet, uh, Pegasus boots are always equipped. Link also eats one of the apples that he gets from the tree. This could be entirely for aesthetics, or perhaps each one restores a bit of health. We don't really know since it zooms in on him, and we don't hear any sort of recovery sound effect. The biggest difference from this location is probably these rock structures. In the original, I never really knew what they were supposed to be. They kind of looked like eyeballs. For the most part, the fishing minigame looks the same, but we do have a few notable differences. First of all, it's nice to see the fisherman's hut in this shot as it shows continuity. The camera also does this really adorable zoom into Link's face but this also confirms how not much work was put into his facial expressions. I understand why they would do that, but it was one of the complaints many people had. But the biggest change is the fish. For those who don't know, there's a special prize you can get from the fish closest to Link. However, in this remake, it appears that the location of this fish was changed. Not only that, but it stands out more in terms of size and color. The next part in the trailer is my personal favorite. We get to see footage of the town tool shop. But things are a bit different this time. The original had six items for sale, but only four displays were visible at any time. The remake adds two more spots, allowing a total of six items to be sold at once. The Game Boy version sold a total of six items. Arrows, bombs, a bow and arrow set, hearts, a shield, and deluxe shovel. However, both the shovel and bow shared the same spot in the shop. I didn't say this in the original voiceover, but it's possible that this now means that all six items will have their own spots on the tool shop. That, and it's very possible we'll see a fairy bottle being sold here. None of these existed in the original version, though we do know they were added given the second last shot of the trailer. They also still sell the same quantity of each item, examples being the three hearts and ten bombs. But the greatest part of this shot is what's being implied. You probably know of the infamous part in Link's Awakening where you can steal an item and entering the shop again will get yourself killed. Well, as you'd expect, the same thing happens in the remake. To steal an item, the player must leave the room while the shopkeeper isn't facing them. YouTuber Zeltic manages to do this while playing the demo of Link's Awakening. Here is that clip. Like, it's taking me a long time here. But there we go, you see he wasn't quite facing me, so now we get out with a shovel and you get a really sarcastic message here. Guess what? You got it for free. Are you proud of yourself? So now we've got the shovel really early because it's 200 rupees, which we don't have at this point. But now the shopkeeper gets his retribution and Goku Kamehameha's you, which one hits you completely. It doesn't matter how many hearts you've got, it completely kills you instantly. And guess what? Believe it or not, 
the link in this trailer is doing the exact same thing. And I think it's pretty hilarious. We then see Link fighting a Moblin at a place located right below Mount Tamaranch. One of the things you may notice is how the cliffs seem much lower, which may have been done so the player could see more of the area above. I also really like the detail of the spear hitting the ground after rebounding off Link's shield. We get to see a combination attack of both the bombs and arrows. At first, I thought this was an addition to the remake, but this did exist in the original. And all this time, I never knew. But the section where things get very interesting is the Raft minigame. This is an optional part of the original game where you ride through some rapids to collect as many rupees as possible. First off, the course itself looks very different from the original, but it gets weirder once you see Link use his hookshot to grab a tree. I went back and tried to do this in the original game, but you can't even use the item while on the rapids. And it's also impossible to use it on trees. For the remake, it appears to be a primary method of navigating through this minigame as Link can pull himself to a line of trees. It's definitely the biggest change we've seen yet. Maybe this minigame will actually be fun for once. Actually, another change I notice is that all the flying objects now are surrounded by rings. I thought this was also in the original, but I went back and checked and, yeah, all the flying objects only have wings on them. Two rooms of the Bottle Grotto dungeon are shown off, and it looks a lot better. Link's Awakening DX had some very strange coloring choices for the dungeons, which made the whole thing look very busy. I have my own theory on this. It's probably because they wanted to show off the colors of the new system. Why else would we have blue walls? Or are they purple? I'm colorblind if you couldn't tell. This room in specific has the Paul's voice enemy. Like the original, they seem to be easily defeated with pots. And we get to see one of the dungeon mini-bosses, a Hinox. The thing I noticed when comparing it to the original was how instead of taking a full heart of damage, you only lose half a heart when he throws you. He also does have very similar colors to the original design. And on the south wall, we can see the other side of one of those panel doors from the Game Boy game. The cracks still do exist in this room, but they match the floor's design a lot better. Another mini-boss is shown off, Master Stalfos. And while I won't spoil what dungeon it comes from, there's a very interesting change within the remake. In the original, this room contains a single block in the upper left corner. I'm not going to spoil what it does, but let's just say that it plays an important role in the dungeon. And we know that this is the same room as the original, as it's the only one with two doors to the bottom and right. So either they changed up how to play this dungeon, or there's some other thing that plays the same role that we don't know about. I guess they just love spoiling mini-bosses for us because we get to see what Cue Ball looks like. Yes, that's its name. One notable thing to point out is how Link is able to jump over it with the rock's feather. I don't think it was possible to do this in the older version, given the already mentioned problem with the hitboxes. This time, an actual boss of one of the dungeons is shown. I'm gonna skip this one because there really isn't that much of a difference. This fight does stand out though as the only one in the 2D platforming mode. The last thing to take note of is the brand new house close to Mave Village. This is where you find Dompe, a character that never made his appearance in the original game. And this is where you get access to the Dungeon Maker. However, this also means that the camera shop no longer exists as it was replaced. You were able to take photographs of a variety of events. And while I never got to doing it, I know that some people were hoping it would return in the Switch version. And that's the entire trailer of Link's Awakening. Some things weren't talked about, but that's most likely because they fall under a different category for this video, including the Dungeon Maker. However, it will get its own section in the video because the Treehouse Live event goes into more detail about it. Speaking of Nintendo Treehouse, there was quite a bit of information revealed not only in the game, but from the hosts. I can't go much further into this before mentioning that Terran is eating a couple bananas and it's so random that it somehow works. We get a look at Ulrira's house, and this one has some significant changes. Starting off, there are only two pots in this room. The same furniture from the original game is present in the bottom left corner, but rearranged. And Grandpa Ulrira is sitting right beside his desk with the phone which as players know is this game's method of giving you tips for your adventure. 
The lines of drawers on the back wall have been changed with a variety of home decor that makes the room feel a lot more cozy. Definitely an improvement compared to the original. The room with the phone itself has abandoned its square shape to go with a more natural look, as this place is supposed to be the inside of a tree. The exterior of the trendy game building has gotten quite a makeover as well, now having a picture of a claw on the top of the shop. In the original, this building's exterior was just a recoloring of the sprite used for the town tool shop, which was always confusing, especially since it had the shop text on the front when it was more so a minigame. Speaking of minigames, they seem to have changed most of the ones from the original to make them much more enjoyable. In the older version, all of the items were on a single conveyor belt that looped around. Not only did this add to the confusion, but the claw was really slow in picking up items. There was a setup to make this work 100% of the time, but it should have really been less complicated. In the remake, the only items on moving platforms are the magic powder and shield, and it plays much more like a crane game, even including the claw physics. But while it's possible to drop the prizes after you grab them, it doesn't look like it's frustrating levels of difficulty. And who can forget the Yoshi doll, one of the items in a very long trading sequence. The original sprite for this looked pretty good actually, though this one was a side view. But we do have some changed text in this portion. They both mention how he's shown up in many games, while the Switch version takes us further by joking about just how many games he has been in. By the way, I just did the research. Apparently the answer to this is 101. I challenge anyone to try and name as many games possible. And no cheating. I'll know. The Quadruplet's house has been completely made over. It looks a lot more like a house that would have children, given the variety of colorful decorations within the room. Even some pictures presumably drawn by the children. This one in particular stands out as it may be referencing the windfish. The left side of the room used to be filled with only pots, but most of them are gone and replaced with a small kitchen-like station. We get to have a brief look at the trading quest, though there's nothing noteworthy as it plays out the exact same. It's one of the key parts of this game and its story, so I won't spoil anything. Now, this is where things get interesting. They decide to pick up one of the Kukos, which means that the power bracelet is no longer required. But as many Zelda fans know, Kukos have a habit of attacking the player if repeatedly struck. Wow, okay, so originally what was in the script was I talked about how I booted up my old game and tried to get a Kuko attack in Link's Awakening and I got nothing. It led me to assume that this type of thing wasn't in the Zelda game. But after going back and redoing it to get footage, I decided to wait a bit longer and yeah, turns out there is a Kuko attack in Link's Awakening. And it's also pretty amazing because they literally just keep going until you die. Back to you, past NBC. However, Game Explain was able to test this out on the Switch version, and, well, the results speak for themselves. Oh, here they come. Oh, nice. <laughs> Get out of there. They're, they're going to kill you. Go inside the house if you can. Oh, no, they're gone. All right. You survived. Oh, go, get in there. Get in there. Nice. The heart saved you. Nice. But this is where things get very interesting. In case you don't know, Link's Awakening was the only Zelda game to ever let you kill Kukos. All you need to do is use either the Fire Rod or Magic Powder. Doing this will actually kill the Kuko and you'll be given a blue rupee. So my question is, will it be possible to do the same thing in the Link's Awakening remake? Stay tuned because I'm probably going to make a video about it once the game releases. There's a quick glimpse of the doghouse as well as a portion of Madame Meow Meow's house. Aside from the improvements and room decoration, there's nothing else that special about it. We also get names for the children within this village. From what I know, in the original they were all referred to as quadruplets. The names of the kids throwing the ball are Junya and Kido. And there's also a new sign within this village, guiding the players to Dompe's shack. Here's one pleasant surprise, the Color Dungeon makes a return in this remake. This was introduced in the DX version of the game to show off the system's capability of displaying colors. But like the other dungeons, they have toned down the amount of colors used while still keeping them in. Something to note is that unlike the original, the player does not have to identify each skeletal guard's color. Experienced players know that completing this dungeon requires a magic powder, meaning that you would have to enter this place with some in your inventory. But in this version, you can actually buy some from the skeletal guards making it much more convenient for the player. Also, their names are Gar and Dion. That's pretty great. We get an in-depth look at the Camel Goblins, one of the Color Dungeon's exclusive enemies, and their redesign in the remake is impressively on point with the original sprites. 
we don't get to see the blue variant of this enemy, though there would be nothing noteworthy to add. Fun fact, the design and behavior of these enemies were based on the Bubla enemies from Yoshi's Island. We get a look at two more of the rooms in this dungeon. What you'll notice is how the wall has a crack in it. In the original, this was a secret that, if bombed, would reveal a room full of green rupees. However, aside from using your sword to check the walls, there was no indication of whether a part could be blown up. This means that all the rooms with bombable walls will most likely have cracks, which in my opinion is a massive improvement. Also, the rupees are a different color, though each one still has the same value of 5 rupees. This leads to the last part of the event, the Chamber Dungeons. This is a very basic dungeon maker where you can move rooms around to create your own dungeons. It's not Mario Maker levels of customization, but it's good signs for a possible Zelda Maker in the future. As you complete the dungeons from Link's Awakening, you'll get pieces for each room cleared. What I'm curious about is whether this will include rooms from the Color Dungeon. In the actual builder, the pieces are neatly categorized into different types. The triangle represents the entrance pieces, while the monster head is boss chambers. The following four icons represent the amount of doors each room has. And because there can be multiple directions of where these exits take you, the rooms are further categorized based on the position of these rooms. Each dungeon needs a minimum of two things, an entrance and boss chamber. All of the doorways of the rooms must also be connected to each other. Think of how Skykeep works in Skyward Sword. Each piece has three different icons which let the player know what is in each room, whether it be treasure chests, locked doors, or stairways. Speaking of stairways, a sub-area is automatically created to connect each end. Whether these can be customizable or not is unknown. After you finish making your dungeon, you must complete it, similar to Mario Maker. We see how this customization works in the Treehouse event, as well as one of the layouts. As of now, there appears to be four confirmed layouts, and it's a mission-based system. Less of a way to challenge the player and more so teaching them how to construct their own dungeons. For example, in the shot of the dungeon menu we can see one mission called A Passage Across. It's assumed that this one exists to teach the player how to use the stairs and sublevels to connect two rooms. This also confirms that you don't have to completely fill up the map in these missions, as five squares are left untouched. We can see some shovel buttons in the top right of the screen, meaning that these challenges are most likely broken up into three different difficulty levels. Beginner, Intermediate, and Expert. The game will also keep track of the fastest clear time for a dungeon, as well as other information like how many chests or locked doors are in a chamber dungeon. It'll be interesting if we can eventually build a dungeon that uses all 64 squares, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But they do go through one of the dungeons made, and I'm not going to talk much about these rooms since it's a mashup of all the dungeons. But we do get to see another one of the bosses, Genie. The first thing you'll notice is a change in the room layout. However, since this is within the chamber dungeon, it's possible that it's purposely different. But one change comes from the boss itself. He still throws fire at you, but instead of staying in the top half of the room, he'll move around the whole space. And even more changes come in the second phase. There's quite a bit to take in here in terms of differences, so I'm just gonna let the footage speak for itself. Dad, no idea what that means, but all right. So, now, what he does is he kind of glitches all over the screen and then chucks a random fireball at you. Uh, you hit him once, he does it again. Feel for it. I'd write it though. No, that's yeah, true. I can tell you for sure. Uh, Spend 26 years. Oh, and he's in, the, he's in the second phase. Uh, nice. And there's also going to be an amiibo of Link releasing. Honestly, I've sort of forgotten about these things. But while I don't collect any, I'm definitely going to pick this one up because it looks pretty freaking adorable. It also will add what is called a plus effect to the chamber dungeons. For example, the Link's Awakening amiibo will add a shadow link to the dungeon. And according to the hosts, it's a boss that will chase Link around the rooms of the dungeon. All the Zelda amiibo will work with the game, though their plus effect on the chamber dungeons are still unknown. So it's time to look at the gameplay demo itself. What's great about analyzing this is the fact that everyone plays the game differently. While one might just try and beat the first dungeon as fast as possible, others will take their time and explore the overworld. Let's talk about the controls and game interface. One of the things many people were wondering about was whether the game would have 360 degrees controls similar to A Link Between Worlds. However, the player will have octagonal movement. Both the sword and shield no longer have to be equipped to the item buttons, as they are always mapped to the A and B. I believe the shield uses A while B is saved for the sword. 
This is great since the original made you swap them in and out as items. The Game Boy only had the A and B buttons, so this decision was mandatory. This means the X and Y buttons will be saved for dungeon items such as the Rock's Feather and Hookshot. We do get to see the title screen of the game thanks to Nintendo Wire's video. Nothing too significant, just an interesting detail. In the original game, there's the cutscene of Link getting shipwrecked onto the island right before Marin finds him on the beach. So it's unknown if what we saw in the first trailer is really going to be the in-game cutscene or if they'll remake it to fit the rest of the game's art style. I have to say that the menu in this game is very clean. It's clearly been revamped since the original, and if we look at one of the Treehouse live shots, all the equipable items are on the right side of the screen. There's a section for all the instruments of the sirens received from the dungeons, and to the left of that are the items which are always equipped. Notice how the sword, shield, power bracelet, and pegasus boots are now in the section. There's Link's tunic, one of the items for the trading quest, and another one right beside it. I'm not too sure about what this one is supposed to be, as it doesn't match any of the sprites from the Game Boy version. At the bottom, we can see where the dungeon keys go. Right now, there are both the tail and slime keys. I'm not too sure about what goes in the middle part. All we see is the secret seashell item taking the first shot. The rest could be dungeon items. There's still stuff like the magnifying lens and flippers. I went ahead and added the other items to this menu just to see how many spaces would be left. And there were still four. My thoughts? Probably four fairy bottles. We've already seen one as some sort of reward for doing the chamber dungeons, and I have a feeling that another one may be sold at the town tool shop. We can also get a quick glimpse at what the map looks like. And for comparison, here's the one from the original version. It wasn't very helpful as it didn't have the names of any locations and if you wanted to know anything you'd have to go to the Mave Village Library. But now the names of all the main locations are right on the chart which will make traveling much more convenient. There's also an icon here, probably meant for the library. My guess is any building you enter will automatically be registered onto the map. What's really interesting is how if you zoom into the sections not yet filled out, you can still get an idea of what lies there. But what I find very interesting is how like Breath of the Wild, you can actually add pins to the dungeon maps. So if you find something that you might have to come back to, it makes that process a whole lot easier. And it looks like we just found out where our dungeon items go, meaning that this spot in our inventory will probably be for every other item. It's really hard to analyze the music as the best way to explain it is just letting you guys listen to it. So this segment is going to consist of me just showing off bits of all the tracks I could find. Some I will leave until the end because there may be certain things about them worth discussing. If you want to skip this part and go back to the commentary, a timecode will be shown on the video that you can skip to.
One of the notable differences comes from the power-up music that plays whenever you get a piece of power or guardian acorn. In the original, the music was extremely loud and obnoxious. Here's a clip of that music. It never ends. But in the remake, they've toned down the volume of it so it's far less noticeable. Instead, Link will glow with either a blue or red color depending on what power-up he gets. It works a lot better, and is far less annoying. We also get two variations of the Ballad of the Windfish. One of them is at the end of the second trailer. The second one is the tune that Marin sings. Unfortunately, the only footage I have of this is the Treehouse live event, so there is commentary over it, but I'll play it anyway. Seemingly inescapable island by finding the eight instruments of the sirens and awakening the windfish, and Marin here is singing my uh, one of my all-time favorite songs, Ballad of the Windfish. It's an original song from this game. There is also some music of the color dungeon, though again the commentary kind of drowns it out. Something I didn't realize though when researching for this video is that it's sort of a remixed version of the Zelda NES dungeon theme. Here are both songs. One last thing to note is how, unlike the original, these themes smoothly transition into one another when you enter a new area. Since the original's world was divided into a bunch of smaller chunks, the themes just kind of abruptly cut out when changing screens. It's an expected change, but still a welcome one. So, in the first trailer, there was a shot of one of the subsections where some Goombas were shown, before they had a very Super Mario Bros. style. But within some of the demo footage, you can see that they now resemble the designs in the Game Boy version a lot more. Just shows how much Nintendo cares about the smaller details. I also want to briefly bring up the shield, since it now has an actual design. It seems to resemble Skyward Sword's design the most. It's just nice to see it in this game, as the original one wasn't very interesting. And now it's time to talk about everything I missed. Because I went through a lot of information in this video, and I was bound to forget a few things. First of all, there was a little secret in the original Link's Awakening with the Buzz Blobs. Now, these guys normally will electrocute Link whenever he attacks them. However, in Link's Awakening, if you use magic powder on them, it actually changes them into another enemy called a Cuke Man. It makes their eyes pop out a lot more, and they can also talk to Link, which is very strange. Luckily, YouTuber Zeltic checked this out, and it still does exist in the remake. Uh, like this, so this buzz blob, if we put magic powder on, becomes this thing, which is called a Cukeman, and he, he can talk to you now, and he has googly eyes. I don't know why, but I'm glad they kept that in. Obviously, I didn't show off a ton in the comparisons for the demo footage because there's just so much I could look at, but I thought I'd go ahead and take a look at one thing, the uh, fairy fountain, because we do see that in the demo, and I thought it would just be kind of cool to see what it looked like before compared to how it looks now. And that's the entire analysis of the stuff shown for Link's Awakening at E3. This video took a very long time, as I had to look through basically everything I could find. Hopefully this helps people who weren't able to watch either the trailer, Treehouse Live event, or demo footage, as all of the new stuff was covered in this video. Final thoughts? I'm hoping that most people have grown to like the game and its art style. It isn't for everyone, but from what I've seen, it looks absolutely gorgeous and I can't wait to get my hands on it. I will be streaming it when it comes out, so I hope you all look forward to that. Special thanks to all my patrons. You are absolutely, positively, awesome. Feel free to subscribe and check the link below if you too want to donate. Of course, never feel obligated to do so. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys later. <laughs>